This is a Dreamcast disc and is for use only on a Dreamcast unit. Playing this disc on a hi-fi or other audio equipment can cause serious damage to its speakers. Dreamcast, up to six billion players. Welcome back to the stage of history. Why don't we play together? Hey, 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 it's time to make some crazy money. Are you ready? Here we go! Please stop this disc now. Now, 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 now. I'm gonna try my hardest not to cough through this. I've had a, I've had a massive like just been I've just been coughing my guts up for like the past week and a half. So I'll, I'll do my best. No, you feel free. Feel free to cough your guts up as much as you like, directly into the microphone, preferably. Uh, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this episode 63 of the Dreamcast Junkyard Dream Pod. My name is Tom, and I'm joined by a an international troop of uh, Dreamcast, uh, I was going to say experts then, but that might be pushing it a little bit, uh, Dreamcast fans and aficionados. I'm, I'm joined, as ever, by uh, my regular co-host, Mike Phelan. Hello, Mike. Hello, Tom. I'm joined yes. as well, uh, across the globe, by one of our other regular co-hosts. His name is Ross. Hello, Ross. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ross, Ross joined by our international correspondent, the squeaky chair, as you can hear. Uh, also joined by another regular co-host. His name is James. Hello, James. Hello. Do I class as an international? It's most technical. I mean, you you are in Wales, so you know it is technically another country. (laughs) If you know the rumours about the the Brexit splits are going to you know come Uh true, then you know Wales and Scotland could uh, split away, and you you would truly then be international. Yeah. Um, Uh, we do have two new uh, hosts, uh, both of whom ha- are going to be writing for the uh, the main site uh, and also hopefully regular voices on the podcast. One gentleman is named Lewis. Welcome, Lewis. Hello. Uh, would you like to tell everyone who's listening who you are and, and you know what you've um, done in the past? So, hello, I am Lewis, and uh, I'm. I want to say I'm mainly known, but I'm probably not very much known for uh, writing. Um, I have a website called uh, Altmag and. I've been writing all my uh, kind of geeky thoughts on there and hoping people read them. Um, and I think actually, like, it's bec- it's quite cathartic to get all your thoughts down. So it's really cool to be part of the Dreamcast junkyard because it's nice to get those uh, thoughts to people who actually care about them. Mm. Um, and, yeah, so it's awesome to be on the podcast as well and in the presence of other like-minded fans of this Awesome console, yeah. Excellent. There you go. Cool. It's come full circle for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've known about your site for, for years, and I've been, you know, I've been frequenting it, you know, every now and then to see what new articles have gone up there. So I'm familiar with your work. Um, excellent. Uh, we also have another new co-host and uh, writer for the Junkyard. Uh, his name is Mark. Hello, Mark. People might know you as a different name online, but uh, if you'd like to just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, cheers, Tom. So thanks for that. So yeah, so uh, my, I'm known mainly as uh, as kind of Mark from Maz Gaming, which is a YouTube channel dedicated to mainly Sega stuff mainly retro so a hell of a lot of dreamcast bits uh so like the the initial idea was basically to be just a dreamcast uh channel but then because i was doing it with a friend and he he liked to he kind of was keen to do other things as well it kind of uh, went from there but yeah certainly sega focused and uh, the dreamcast for me has always been my my favorite console ever since launch um and i've literally been listening it's, it's, it's really weird just you know just like lewis said kind of come full circle but i've been reading the site uh, reading things on the site for pff, almost forever and then i've been listening to the dream Pod ever since i think maybe the second or third uh, episode so it's yeah it's, it's, it's a little bit surreal to be in a... cool cool no uh, people might know you for a different reason uh recently for us, a particular console that you you actually own Could you talk a little, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that and then we can take the piss out of you yeah of course yeah so <laughs> uh, yeah so uh, i'm i'm the guy behind the uh the the kind of dreamcast 2 branded nintendo switch that went that went viral a few weeks ago and caused a bit of a storm so it's kind of like absolutely two camps one people could, could kind of see the point about the fact that i didn't really want to be using a N- nintendo console so it's kind of turning it into a bit of a sega thing for myself and then you had the other side of the coin that was oh my god absolute sacrilege you know like this guy needs to be you know like, like needs to be arrested for doing that to him <laughs> uh, for, for, for all that stuff so, yeah so it was really odd it was kind of picked up by uh kotaku and nintendo life and uh euro gamer and yeah i kind of i, I kind of i got one email from kotaku that i thought was a wind-up and then within about four hours, the article was up, and then I woke up in the morning, and it was like, yeah, the whole thing had just gone like crazy, crazy big. So uh, yeah, it's been really good. We got, you know, the the channel got a lot of uh, a lot of content, uh, well, a lot of views from it. Um, but yeah, like I say, not all not all positive, but I'd say it was probably seventy thirty in the positive 
Yeah, so yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Living living kind of in the internet age as we do, um, the uh, the way that you know something that you do quite innocently for your own entertainment that can literally just turn into something that somebody else finds incredibly was, offensive was, for no reason. I was going to say, Tom, <laughs> I don't believe that. I don't believe for a moment that the gaming community would make negative comments about anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just a figment of, uh, of our imaginations. Um, anyway, uh, we're here to talk about Dreamcast and, well, other things as well. Uh, but we will start the podcast as we always do, and we will talk a little bit about some things that we've played on the current gen systems and some things we've picked up for maybe some other retro systems on the Dreamcast. Um, Mike, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, we, we'll talk a little bit about Play Expo Blackpool in a little while, but... Yeah. Um, what have you been playing on, on current gen? What have you been playing on, on the Dreamcast or otherwise? So, uh, as regular listeners to the podcast will know, I, I do play a bit of uh, off-road racing games on one gen consoles. And I've been playing a game called The Car 18, which is uh, based on the, the car rally. Um, it's not very good. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's one of those games which sort of like has a really, really cool concept and a really good idea. Um, I think sorry. I think I think Rossi. I think Rossi's chair wanted to ask a question. Then the chair. The chair was asked a question. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have much effort. You don't have much effort. It's taking to not make that chair speak. <laughs> Jesus. But the the it's got a really cool concept of the game, but it's um it's it's not very well made. So it's a bit of a bit of a shame because of the it's a very long stage rally basically. Um, I've also been playing as everyone else probably has Red Dead Redemption Two. Mm. Um, and a couple of other games on modern gens, but well, really the the main ones for me, pick up wise, have been my Neo Geo Mini. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I picked it up. What, what, what's the verdict? International on that? version. Shite. I really like. I really like it. I knew what. I knew Ross would be a. I knew <laughs> Ross. You can rely on Ross to put a. No, it's it's. I understand why it's. I understand why it's not um everyone's cup of tea, but for me. Nice, simple, really, really lovely screen. Really, really nice. To screen. be fair, Mike, half the Dreamcast collection you have is, is quote, not everybody's cup of tea. So oh. I don't think that's too much of a barrier. 100%, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's a, really, it's a really good little thing. I, I like it. Um, don't listen to Ross. Um, and also, we're talking about Ross, he actually sent me some Dreamcast games as well. So um, Ross Ray kind of, Did you get the magazine as well? I just received the magazine on nice. Thursday. So it's a bit late, but I got it eventually. So what were the games um, then? But some amazing stuff from Ross. He found some stuff on uh, Japanese auction sites. Um, so I've got two more games to my collection, uh, Bold Force Sexy and one of the baseball games, um, and a ton of uh, demo discs from Dreamcast Magazine. So I'm starting to play through mm. some really cool stuff on there. Um, and a magazine which has got a data disc full of, uh, of VMU data, which is fantastic. Well, that's good. That's um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, but if you've noticed, it's it's because um, I, I saw it and I was like, oh, I'll, I'll, I think I'll load that up and take some of those files. But yeah. then I realised it's like still sealed, never been opened. So I was yeah. like, oh, can't rip open Mike's magazine. No, so I haven't opened it myself yet. So, <laughs> but there's there's the the demo discs. They come from one of the Dreamcast magazines in Japan, and um, there's tons of videos and and sort of VMU data on them as well and demos. Um, so it's good fun to to look through them. Um, a bit like looking through Dream One discs. I know you've done that as well, Tom, in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent, cool. Okay, um, uh, just a quick word on uh, Red Dead Redemption Two. Um, mm. how, how I mean, it doesn't really appeal to me because I, it looks like, from what I've read, it's a really, really long game, and I play games in like short spurts, so I, it wouldn't be something that I'd be interested in. But um, yeah, I've seen a lot of good, uh, a lot of good feedback about it on you know the various games websites and things. What's your verdict? I haven't played much yet because um, it, it, I was going to play it when I came back from Play Expo, which I mm. know we'll go into in a bit, but um, I've, I've been working since then. So I only played it two days ago, first time. Oh, okay. Nice. I really like it. I love, I love Red Dead Redemption uh, 1. I love, I love Red Dead Revolver as well. So it's a, it's a really good Western-themed game. Um, it looks amazing. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Ross, what about you? Not, not a Neo Geo, I take it. I need you a table, tabletop thing. <laughs> no, no, not a chance. Um, I've been playing, um, well, this weekend, Doom VFR. Oh, yeah, it's good. Um, on the Vive. And despite the mixed reviews, I really enjoyed it. It's one of the best-looking VR games I've ever played. Um, it plays very much like Doom 2016 in that you have to continually keep moving. But, of course, you're teleporting, so you've got to continue, continuous, continuously teleport all over the place otherwise you'll die pretty quickly it was good yeah. game very short only two and a half hours long plus there's like four 
classic Doom levels that are kind of novel to play. But yeah, not not very long. Hard found, to recommend at the sorry, price sorry. tag, but I'd pick it up on a sale if you, if you can. Yeah, yeah, I found that um, when I was playing it on the PSVR, the the, the the sort of the major issue that I had was actually being able to look around and think. It was only when I decided that you know maybe I should stand up and play the game. You know, so I've got full mm-hmm. 360 degree movement. It, it it made the game immeasurably better. So if you are listening to this and you've got Doom VFR, try playing it standing up as opposed to sitting down. It completely changes the game. Sorry, Ross, continue. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I've got to say about Doom VFR. Um, definitely worth checking out if if it's at a reasonable price. I think the full RRP is a bit much for two and a half hours. But yeah, uh, other than that, Tetris Effect came today. Mm. Um, been enjoying that. That's another one though that is difficult to justify the price tag but um yeah if you're if you're a fan of mizuguchi's games res and uh, luminous and all that then you'll feel right at home um i mean it's just classic tetris but as your i mean of course it's got like um very trippy background graphics and music but then as you're moving the pieces from left to right and plonking them down and rotating them it's different sound effects and music that you're creating passively while doing that so yeah it's really cool really trippy i don't have a psvr so i can't play it in vr obviously but uh it's very immersive and i i bet it's even better in vr cool what about uh, retro yeah. on the dreamcast at all oh retro yeah oh yeah oh yeah of course i always forgot about that yeah the last um about last week um about a week ago i started playing sega gaga of course, and I yeah, finished yeah. that yesterday. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I completed it yesterday. Um, cool. But yeah, I, I mean, it's very different to how I imagined it to be honest. I think so many yeah. people talk about it, um, but very few people have played it, and yeah. especially played it all all the way through or played enough of it to know what it's all about. I mean, it's like one part dungeon crawling RPG with Pokemon elements, um, where you have to catch these game developers and then after you've caught them you you take the game developers into a studio and then it's like kind of like a virtual pet game development studio kind of thing where you have to com- keep all your developers happy and make them make a good game and then it's also one part like visual novel um, and it's got a bunch of like really cool mini games well, not really cool but it's got some like kind of nice mini games with lots yep. of references to Sega characters and Dreamcast. One thing that I was a bit disappointed about was um on your first playthrough, I mean everyone knows the famous shmup uh level, right? Where the, right. you fight all the Sega hardware from the SG one thousand up to the Saturn yep. in like this two D shmup. It's like really famous online. You can't get that on your first playthrough. Um on your first playthrough it's really quite difficult to even get enough market share to survive the first seven chapters. But then to, to get past the seventh chapter, you have to get 100% market share. So on your first playthrough, I, I believe it's impossible to get that. And you get to chapter seven, and then you get one of the bad endings. And then with the new, new save plus, you can start again and go for the 100% and get the remaining chapters plus that. Uh, shmup part. but yeah really good game um visuals and sound are really basic and budget but yep. uh, there's something really endearing about it probably partly because of it's how the, i think it's the it's um, put together i think it's the uh it, its name kind of precedes itself and it? it's one of those legendary dreamcast games that hardly anyone's played but everybody kind of knows about mainly because of the sort of the special editions and the the way that it's almost like a sort of um it's it's kind of like a a, a game within a game do you know what I mean? Where you know yeah. you are controlling. Yeah. Basically, you're trying to promote Sega within a game. If that, if I've got that right. Um, yeah, yeah, you've got it right. There's, there's, I mean, there's, there's a few different like interweaving parts of the story. The main part of the story is that you're working for Sega Gaga or for Sega, and you're trying to gain market share from Dogma, the mm-hmm. representing Sony, of course. That's like the main storyline. But then. And that's what most of the visual novel sections are about. But then when you're inside the dungeons, the dungeons are all game studios within Sega. And it's kind of a like a commentary on how it's, it's, it's has, it shares quite a lot of parallels with like these, these things that are going on now with Rockstar. There's, it's become quite a controversial issue with how some of the 
people have worked there felt oh, they yeah, were mistreated yeah. and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing that Sega ever even gave the game the go-ahead because yeah. it's all a commentary on that, on like how working in the games industry um, is like long hours and yeah, yeah. poor conditions and stuff. And as as you go into the Sega studios at the beginning, the very one of the first things your character says is, oh, when, as you come up to these massive big vault-like doors, he's like, oh, are these vault doors to keep um keep the secrets inside sega or keep people out and the person you're with comments no 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 those big vault doors are to keep the game developers in yeah so they don't (laughs) escape the the entire game was it felt like it felt like it was a bunch of developers who just were were tired and sort of they've had so much bad times in the last few years they just wanted to get all that frustration out and make it into a game that's what i felt like anyway yeah Yeah, definitely and wow that's uh, and it's unbelievable sega probably just sega was so desperate at the time they were like just like yeah fuck it go ahead and make it yeah (laughs) and it's pretty cool and like in between each chapter there's these like little puppet shows it's like so cheaply made like there's two guys hid behind the sign outside the sega headquarters um in tokyo in haneda i've actually been there and been to that sign and they're doing this puppet show with these two characters. One's like a little girl and one's uh, some kind of dinosaur or something. I don't know. And, and it, it has nothing to do with the rest of the game. It's just at the end of a chapter, there's this little interlude, interlude where they ask questions about the game industry. And, and after you complete the game, the very last one, the dinosaur says to the little girl, um, oh, big sister, why isn't the Dreamcast selling too well? And the sister says, oh, well, that's because... And then it cuts out and goes, <laughs> and that's the end of the game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Great. That's brilliant. But yeah, cool game. Excellent game. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, let's move on to uh, to James. James, what have you been doing? I know you've been doing a lot of racing in your uh, souped-up Clio. Um, uh, is it a Clio? I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of, of real racing, yeah. yeah, not, yeah. not so much uh, simulation stuff. Um, no, gaming-wise, uh, well, Retro Dreamcast, I actually picked up a game I've never owned. Talking to demos earlier, I played um, a lot of this demo. I think it was one of the first games I actually played on a Dreamcast demo unit in, like, Odeon Cinemas or something, but mm. um, Ready to Rumble. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I yeah. was... Uh, Always loved the demo, played it like loads and loads of times and um, just never, ever bought the full game. Um, and it was I was in my my local CEX and they seem to have a load of Dreamcast stuff recently. Um, and every time I go in there, they seem to have like a stack of like six or ten different games. But anyway, it was two pound fifty. So I was like, well, I'm not going to leave it here for two pound fifty. So bought that. Haven't played it yet, but we'll probably get get to play through that um at some point i've been mostly i got my dream pie um updated with the uh the latest firmware and stuff because they've added a load of new titles we discussed it a couple of dream pods ago so just been doing a bit more online gaming again with mm. some of the guys there's a regular session that runs on a sunday night which i normally take part in but we play quite a bit of um uh, worms will party which is still such a good game yeah. Um, obviously a pretty timeless series and still looks fantastic as well um, so yeah just uh, just enjoying a bit of old online gaming which still makes me smile just sitting down playing a Dreamcast online with a keyboard in 2018 every time we uh, every time we connect um, and retro wise the only other thing for me is I got as much as I love the Dreamcast and as much as the Dreamcast will always be probably my favorite ever console before the Dreamcast came along, the, the PlayStation, the original PlayStation was very much kind of the the console that kind of got me into, or I would say turned me into a hardcore gamer, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd always played games before. I played Mega Drive and SNES and, and everything else. But it was the PlayStation was the first kind of console where I started, you know, looking forward to games when they were coming out, reading magazines about and so on and so forth. Um, and it was the announcement of the PlayStation Classic that just kind of got me a bit, feeling nostalgic and um i dug the ps2 down and a load of my old ps1 games and spent the entire evening playing rally cross which i know me and you have had oh, a conversation nice. about yeah. before Tom. um which was one of my favorite games back in the day it's such a interesting take a uh, unique take which uh, on on sort of the uh semi semi realistic racing i guess you'd call it mm. um but yeah, really enjoyed uh, uh, playing through that, and I was a bit disappointed in the end that that game wasn't actually announced as one of the uh, as one of the the twenty games on the PS Classic. Um, 
Yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting lineup of games, isn't it? I know a lot a lot of people have said that it's quite disappointing, but I mean, with with licensing and that kind of thing, and with only twenty games, you know, you, you're gonna you're gonna have to like miss some things, and yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's it's worth it for me, just I'm mean, purely for the freaking box it comes in, just because it obviously mimics the original box. Um, but I think it's you know they managed to put Metal Gear Solid on it and Destruction Derby, which are two of my favourite games you know growing up so it's probably worth a purchase for that alone but um yeah i think they um unlike the nintendo ones obviously a lot of their um uh, the, the their kind of key key ip games things like gran turismo they'd never get away with because of all the licensing agreements yeah, and stuff totally. in it, as you said tony hawk is the same is is another one that everyone um, talks about when they talk about dream uh, playstation but again all the licensing for all the music in that it just wasn't possible so so yeah still looking forward to it uh, and then on contemporary stuff I think, Mike, you were very, very diplomatic about Dakar 18. I, I think it was one of the worst games I've played <laughs> on current gen stuff, to be honest. Um, I got sent a review key at that, and, and I'm, I hope you didn't pay full price for it, Mike, is, is all I'll say on the matter. Um, is it just broken? Game, is, it, is it just janky, or, or what? Is that an issue? It's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. It's, it's, it's just awful, mm. is, is my one, my one word review on it. <laughs> In more... It's, more interesting though, and and kind of tenuously linked to Dreamcast here is a game that's been out for a little while um, called Railway Empire, okay. and it was it was something I had on my wish list for a while, and I just didn't want to pay full price for it, and I, I picked it up for about twelve quid, I think. Um, but I used to love Railroad Tycoon on the Dreamcast. It was one of the games I played all the time. Um, and basically, Railway Empire is transport is rail, Railroad Tycoon um, on modern modern system so um yeah that's kept me interested for uh for a fair few hours um and the only other two things there forza horizon 4 i don't know if any of any of you boys played that but it's just yeah i've played that a lot yeah probably one of the best uh, racing games i've ever played in my life so i've been pouring hours into that since it came out um and my destiny game time continues to grow as the new expansion came out a couple months ago so i think i'm up to like 1200 hours in destiny 2 now wow. uh, <laughs> and, and counting yeah <clears throat> excellent That's pretty much good uh, good mix there okay let's move on to our new hosts uh lewis what have you been doing um so as always i've um just been playing overwatch constantly um i'm obsessed with like the competitive mode even mm. though sometimes it's painful but um other than that because usually if i come home i'm thinking oh i'm gonna play this game usually i just end up playing overwatch which is bad of me because i've got so many good things i can play as well and one of these is a uh, gravity rush 2 um, oh, yeah. which yeah. i, I kind of missed upon um its launch but i went to Aflex Palace in uh, in Manchester, and there was a really cool Gravity Rush 2 poster on sale, and I played the first one, but I liked the poster, so I bought it, but then I thought, I don't want to look like a poser, so I'll actually buy the game, and <laughs> so I bought the game, and um, it's it just makes the first game look like a, a tech demo, like it's just the the graphics and the world and the like the, the size of the the world that you can just fly around in is just amazing actually the story is really deep as well and actually gets quite um serious at times like the first one kind of had like a, a cool story but um i think the second one really kind of goes quite deep with what it's trying to achieve and it's just a shame that um you know it's kind of the second game's limited by the fact that you know people want to be playing the first one first in order to kind of be up to date on the story but I mean, if it didn't have that barrier to entry, I would just say ignore the first one and just play the second, and you'll be amazed by like what it ha- what it has on offer. It's, um, it's um, an interesting game that um, Gravity Rush Two because it, it, when it when it was launched, it was it, it kind of got lost, didn't it? I don't remember what other games came out around the same time, but I remember knowing about it because I played the first one on the Vita. It was one of my favorite games on the Vita. I thought it was amazing. Um, and then it's almost like it, there's, a, there's a certain category of games on the PS, uh, on the PlayStation 4, which are like builders, these kind of marquee games. And then again, they get lost and nobody ever talks about them ever again. Things like Tearaway Unfolded, um, an amazing mm. game, uh, PS4 exclusive, that very few people talk about anymore. But I, I think... Grab- well, it's, it's, it's originally on Vita, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you not play it on Vita? Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, I played it, played it on Vita, yeah. Grab it. I don't know how it worked, but I... I, I, I... I felt like that 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 game it 
it used every single feature of the Vita. Like in the the it used a camera. Hmm. So in the cutscenes, when it showed the sun god, it was it was your showing face, your yeah. character <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and all this stuff. Uh, I wondered how it how well it translated to PS4. But well, with the PS4, I think a lot of stuff um, was lost. I mean, you get to use the controller. You know, the light on the controller. You can use that as a torch to like sort of move the right. controller around, and it would direct onto the screen where you're pointing the controller. It's pretty, it's pretty um, ingenious. Um, what really. about on the what about on the Vita where you touch the back of it and oh, you use jump. your fingers to jump and to push things out of the ground and stuff? There is a little. There's, there's use of the what... um, touchpad on the controller, so there is a little bit. Of that. Ah, right. It's not as good as it was on the Vita with the back controls and the, and the touch. Is screen. it a different, completely different game though? Or has it just been like? Yeah, it's a different game. Totally different edited. Game. To, oh, it's a completely different game. So, oh, yeah, it's, it's obviously it's, it's in the I same. I thought they'd somehow ported it and changed some of the features. It's also made of paper and everything, but it's a different game. Anyway, sorry. Uh, oh, nice. let's get. That. <laughs> Please continue. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, if you've played the first Gravity Rush, but even if you haven't, maybe just like look up the the sort of the plot on the first game and just catch up and then just start with the second and it's actually it's, there's actually this like really kind of um emphasis on um the world that you visit how you, you kind of start out on this this kind of island in the sky and it's very beautiful and colorful and every thriving with life and it's kind of very nice but then as actually you find out through playing that as you go lower and lower towards kind of like the the gravity vortex that's like below all of these islands that as the islands go down it they, they get the conditions of the living of the people get worse and worse and actually the people at the they were closest to the gravity vortex are actually like living in absolutely uh, horrible conditions and basically it's this the the main character kind of struggles with um you know wanting to kind of help her friends who she knows you know on the top and then um you know do the odd jobs for them and then she kind of goes against kind of the i guess the government it's it's, it's actually quite a, a deep game even even if you played the first one it's not that deep but then you go on to this and you're thinking wow they really like upped the the story here so yeah. um other than that i uh i also grabbed uh clan ad for the ps4 i wrote an article on the the junkyard about visual novels and uh, I mentioned clan ad but uh, yeah, they yeah. released that on yeah they released that on the PS4 and um it actually has an English option in the Japanese version which is, is amazing so is I it... actually yeah okay wow. so it's actually the uh, um, NTSCJ version but it actually has English text um yeah I just want to say uh, well done to Mike for going through all of the visual novels on the Dreamcast and actually writing quite a uh, uh, quite nice reviews of them. I appreciate that uh, there's a few people out there actually like love this kind of crap genre <laughs> of games. <laughs> like, um, they're not even games, let's face it. But um, yeah, uh, I just but, found it. Yes, I found it that, interesting yeah. that a game like Clannad on the PS4 is basically it, it, so it's, it's technically exactly the same game as the one that's on the Dreamcast. Is that is that on the, um, is that correct? Sorry, no. Clan Ad wasn't on the uh, the Dreamcast. Oh, but, uh, I, I, sorry. Yeah, the, early, the earlier games by the same company were, which is why I brought it out in up oh, in the right. the article. But um, yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, other than that, like retro stuff, um, I I was playing a lot of Saturn. I, was, I got um, the pseudo Saturn um, kind of hack for the uh, action replay, which allows you to play burnt games. Um, and so I was playing a lot of the more expensive ones that I can't ever afford. So I, I was playing KO Flying Squadron 2 hmm. and uh, Burning Rangers, which um, doesn't look the best nowadays, shall we say. But it's still kind of interesting hmm. as a game. And then, uh, oh yeah, I played Sonic Adventure 2 The Trial because apparently I own it. So I was like, what is this? And uh, has anyone ever played that that kind of demo disc of uh, yes, Sonic Adventure 2? Yes, Star Online. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It was yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking about writing an article about it, but then I realised that I don't really know what I'd. I don't know. I was, the comparisons, I don't think, are that different to the actual finished game. So yeah, but it doesn't matter because all you got to do is it's the clickbait. See, it's like you won't believe <laughs> what the differences are. <laughs> you get a thousand people to click it, and then happy days. <laughs> Yeah, it's also weird to hear uh, Sonic speak in Japanese. Obviously, I'm used to this kind of 
cool dude sort of English voice he had, you know, when he kind of came onto the Dreamcast. So it was weird hearing actually the, the dialogue in Japanese for once. So, yeah, weird kind of little uh, oddity that um, I found. I was just, I was looking at, I was playing Fantasy Star and I didn't even realize that it had this disc in the back. I guess I never looked. So, mm. oh well. <laughs> That's cool. it for me, though. So what was. was... Was that with the first version of Fantasy Star then? Because the <clears throat> the version two didn't have that disc from my memory anyway. Yeah, I've just got the like the original. Uh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. The non version two. Yeah. Cool. I've actually got version two to hand. Give me a sec. Um... I know it's, it's it'll be Dream Key two point oh. Oh yeah, it's Dream Key three in the back of this one. Oh three. <laughs> uh, there's a sticker on the uh, on the front of the box as well. I knew there was something in the back of it, but I wasn't sure what it was. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay, uh, Mark. I know it spe- feels like it's probably been a lifetime waiting to speak about uh, what you've been playing, <laughs> but to be honest, I'm not really bothered. So I'm just going to talk to Mark. I'm going to talk instead. No, I'm joking. Um, Mark, <laughs> what, <laughs> what have you been uh, playing and what have you picked up? Um, so nothing really for modern consoles recently. Uh, I've kind of I don't know. I've, I've um, there's nothing really coming out on Switch that's really grabbed me. I've, I've, I don't own a PS4. I don't own an Xbox. So I kind of wish I did purely for Red Dead at the moment because everyone's going on about how good it is. Um, in terms of Dreamcast, I recently I'd, I made the really stupid decision of deciding that I wanted a full PAL set for Dreamcast. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I uh, I was kind of all over eBay and Amazon and picking bits up and then um, weirdly about two days after I decided that. Uh, a friend of mine on Facebook said he was getting rid of his, his entire Dreamcast collection because he wanted to concentrate on getting a full PAL Mega Drive collection. So um, I started off by buying like 10 games off him and then he kept coming back to me going, oh, you know, if you want if uh, if you want another 10, then I'll do you a deal. So in the end, I picked up 45 games um, <laughs> over the course nice. of about three days, which uh, I've, de- I've definitely not told the missus how much I paid for all those. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it is filler. I'll be really honest with you. Like a lot of it's like, you know, like the NFL games that I've no, I've no, no intention of playing. Um, Spirit of Speed was in there that I finally oh. picked up. Now. Oh, you got to play uh, that. It's a brilliant game. Put it in the console. Yeah, put it in the console. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I, I've actually played that before, and then I, I I played it at a friend's house, and I think I think we both just kind of looked, just stared at the screen in disgust and assumed that we'd be <laughs> a broken disc. Um, yeah. Other than that, um, I've not played much Dreamcast stuff because another member of the Dreampod actually has my Dreamcast wires at the moment. So uh, is that me? Yeah, it is you, mate. Oh, I, I knew I had some wires from other people, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> Sorry, I'll get them sent back to you. You should have, you should have nudged me. I didn't realise. Sorry. Right. <laughs> it's all right. Um, although, obviously, I did play a lot at, at uh, Play Expo Blackpool, which I know is coming up very shortly. And also, uh, I, in terms of what I'm actually playing right now, so I picked up a, uh, a Sega Nomad at Blackpool. I knew you'd uh, buy that. I knew it. I knew because uh, you were coming yeah, in it. You were coming oh, yeah. in it, weren't you? You know what? <laughs> like, I was, yeah, as soon as I saw it, I knew I knew I was going to have it. I was just, I was just trying to kind of make a big deal out of it, you know, about whether or not I would or I wouldn't. Just wondering, you know, whether I could haggle the price down. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, yeah, I've, I, honestly, I've loved that. I've basically just been playing Shining Force Two um, on that. So yeah, loving that. But other than that, mate, yeah, I've, I've, it's, it's been a bit. Um, I've not I've, I've not played a lot, but I've picked up a lot recently. Excellent. Yeah, forty five games. That's uh, quite the chunk of the Dreamcast library. Um, excellent. Good, uh, good stuff. Uh, I'll just quickly rattle through what I've been doing. I've not picked anything up because, as I'm sure that you guys are aware, I don't know if the people listening are going to be aware, I'm actually trying to downsize my collection. I will be selling a lot of it off at Bristol Gaming Market, which is coming up in a, in about a week's time. So if you want some uh, Dreamcast bargains, then uh, get yourself down there because I'll be selling a lot of my games off. Um, in terms of current-gen stuff, I've been playing a lot of FIFA 19. My dad actually went and bought himself a PlayStation 4, and it came with FIFA, and he doesn't have any interest in FIFA, so he sort of just gave it to me, so I've been playing through that. Um, interesting that yeah, Mike and um, James have been talking about this Dakar game, because I've been playing one that's quite similar, but it's called Baja, or Badger, um, yep. which is kind of where you race through the uh, the Mexican desert uh, in the uh, in the States. Um it's actually quite good. It's a it's a remaster, if you will, of a of a PS3 game, but it's actually quite well done. Um, doesn't yeah. quite look up to the spec of a, of a of a native kind of PS4 release, but it's a, it's still quite good fun. It's one of the games you can yeah. just kind of play while you're listening to a podcast or a YouTube video or something with the sound down. So yeah, that's that's been quite good. Um, I've also been playing quite a lot, weirdly, on the Vita. Um, I, I I kind of I, I I stopped playing my Vita for and I didn't touch it for about probably about eight or nine months because I just didn't have any new games for it and. I, I wasn't really bothered about playing it because I had the Switch as well at the time. Um, when I got rid of the Switch, I, I found the Vita in a drawer, completely dead, battery, charged it up. And then since then, I've just kind of been going through some of the old games that I, I never really played before. Um, so things like um, Virtual Tennis 4 is, is fantastic on the yeah. Vita. Um, I also started playing the um, 
Sonic and All Stars Racing Transformed, which I'd had from PS Plus from years ago uh, when it was a PS Plus release, and never really put much time into it, uh, but kind of uh, rediscovered it this last week and just been really getting into that and getting all the sort of uh, opening up all the new tracks. Um, some fantastic fan service, you know, uh, you know, re- referencing old Sega games and different franchises. It's, it's really good. There's a lot of detail as well in those worlds that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily expect. Certainly in the, um, there's one stage which is set in the, you know, Nights into Dreams universe. <laughs> and it's just, it, the way it kind of um, captures the, the magic of the Saturn game, it's just really well done. Um, even to the point where it's kind of referencing like boss fights that people, probably a lot of gamers, or younger gamers who, who never really played on a Saturn, for example, they wouldn't really know what, these like references are but because i had a saturn back in the day and i played knights to death um mm. then i recognize all the, all the little references and i was like that's a really nice touch it's great fan service that um and so yeah it'd be good if they could like you know re- release another one of those games on, on current gen systems that'd be really cool and somebody said it'd be really good on the switch as well which i i, I think it probably would be and get rid of some of the frame rate issues anyway from the v they, um, they didn't uh add uh, Ryo Hazuki is a downloadable character in the PS3 version, though, did they? That was the only thing that only bummed PC. me. Yeah, like that sucked. Like I, I remember, I got the game and I was like, "Oh man, I can't wait to get Ryo Hazuki." And then I found out that you, you can only get him on PC. So, oh. that is so, so strange. If they, That's yeah, really weird. And they are releasing a new Sonic Racing game, aren't they? But it, yeah. it feels like a step backward, and it's yeah. just the Sonic, Sonic games, characters. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big Sonic fan, but I mean, there's only about four or five characters in that universe I give a shit about. I don't <laughs> need a whole game full of Sonic's friends. But by all accounts, it's not very good either, from what I've been told from yeah. people who played it. So. Well, it's not finished yet, but yeah, it looks like it's heading that way. Yeah. It's Shame. Delayed, isn't it? Yeah. Um, on the Dreamcast front, I, I've, I've been playing quite a lot of Dreamcast games because I've been doing these uh, these videos, these comparison videos for the DC HDMI, which we'll talk about in a, in a little while. But um, one of the games that I did start playing to record some footage and ended up sitting and playing for ages um, was Guilty Gear X. Um, mm. It's a fantastic 2D fine game. It's probably, with it alongside um, Marvel vs. Capcom 2, it's probably my favourite uh, 2D sprite-based fighting game on the Dreamcast. It just looks amazing. It plays really well. And uh, I just love the sort of the the style. It's got it's got attitude. It's got tood, as you might say in the uh, in the late nineties. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've been playing a lot of Guilty Gear X. So um, yeah. However, that's uh, that's enough about what we've been playing. We've been, well, we've been talking about it for forty minutes nearly. Uh, so if you're still with us, uh, congratulations. But we're now going to move into some. Uh, now we're going to move into some more specific Dreamcast uh, related stuff. Uh, before we do get into the meat of that, though, um, just a little bit of a, a chat about what we uh, did at Play Expo Blackpool a couple of weeks ago. Now, me, myself, and Mike, we went up there. We took the, a long old drive, didn't we, Mike, up to uh, Blackpool? We did indeed. Uh, it took us about. Well, it took me ten and a half hours to drive from Southampton to uh, via Bristol to pick Mike up um, to Blackpool. And uh, that was quite ridiculous because it took Adam Korolik less time to get from Chicago to London and then to Blackpool. Um, so that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that just shows how bad traffic can be um, at certain times of the, of the week and day. Uh, but yeah, it was a really good event. Um, same old kind of uh, setup. We were in the uh, the Norbrecht Castle Hotel uh, Exhibition Centre in Blackpool. And uh, yeah, there were you know thousands of people walking about, uh, coming and checking out the Dreamcast. Had some good chats with uh, obviously yourself, uh, Mark. Um, and you were there with uh, some of the other guys from the YouTube community, and um, yeah, it was it was just really cool to to sort of meet up with everyone. For me, I think even though it's all about like the games and that kind of thing, it's it's also meeting up with people and chatting to people about you know their interests and you know people who've maybe never even played on a Dreamcast come up and say, oh, what's this all about? And you can kind of give them a little bit of a of a crash course in. In Dreamcast and, and you know the, the, the sort of the, the best games in, in the library. Um, yeah. Also wanted to give a special mention to a guy called Quang who uh, runs Asobi Tech. Uh, he does a lot of events, but he kindly uh, borrowed uh, several really cool items to us to put on our display. First of which was the Divers Two Thousand, yeah. um, which I've, I've never actually seen one in, in the flesh or the plastic, as it were. It's really cool. <laughs> I did know that you can't actually activate the Dreamcast side of things without the remote control. So it was good that he also had that included in the box. And um, a couple of Dreamcasts as well, which uh, drew some uh, some curious gazes from people who've never seen a Dreamcast. Um, so, yeah, thanks to him for those. 
And uh, yeah, overall, it was a really good event. And if you if you if you're a regular listener to the podcast, you'll note that um, the last one that we uploaded was episode sixty two, and that was actually a um, a recording of the uh, panel that myself and Mike sat on, along with um, Mark from uh, EJ Slopes Games Room and uh, Adam Korolik, uh, where we took some questions from the audience. I believe Mark, your dulcet tones were on that recording as well. So uh, <laughs> I this was, is, yeah. yeah, this is actually yeah. a second appearance on the Dream Pod, not your first. Uh, <laughs> But that was really cool. Well, yeah, because I, I just thought it was quite funny because it's one of those events where uh, everyone's always scared to ask the first question. So, mm. you know, like, as soon as you said any questions and no one said anything, I was like, okay, you know, I better step up here. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mate. It was, to be honest, from being on the other side of it, being on a panel, I've never been on a panel before. It's quite easy just doing a podcast like this where you kind of sat in, in, in a room with nobody else around you. But when you sat in front of an audience of like maybe 50 or 60 people or however many it was, I was absolutely bricking it. Do you know what I mean? I, I hope. I, I mean, I don't. I know it didn't come across in a video that I was, but I was like really nervous. He was. He and, was. And, and, he and, was and, seriously. <laughs> I mean, Adam was really like cool customer, like he always is. But you know, it, and he said, "I'll oh, just, just relax and it'd be great." And it was. So yeah, it was, and it was really cool to actually sit on a panel and be able to chat with Adam about stuff, you know, away from the panel yep. as well. Um, so yeah, overall, uh, a, a really good event. And I just want to say thanks to you, Mike, as well for your kind of efforts and hard work helping me run the. Uh, running the Dreamcast Junkyard display area because we had about we had about 30 consoles in the end didn't we on, on, on yeah yeah so it was really yeah, cool. it was it was really really good yeah it was really good it was good to see all the people playing games it was we were pretty much packed from the from the time we we opened to the time we, we closed so yeah yeah fantastic yeah. event and uh, uh, yeah Sorry, yeah, I was just going to say, like, just a couple of things. The, the only, I mean, because, like, that was my first big retro event. I've been to EGX and stuff like that, but in terms of the retro stuff, like, I was I was blown away by it. And I think, like, the, especially the Dreamcast uh, Junkyard area was very, was very, very good. And the only thing, only things I will say is um, some of the traders in there. So I think I, said, I actually said to you, Tom, that someone was trying to sell uh, Shenmue 1 for eight, 85 quid. Yeah, we yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just like, like, in what world do you think that that's, t- that that's reasonable? Um, and also the Norbert Castle Hotel. I mean, maybe a grandiose term. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, it's a shit hole. Castle Hotel, oh my God. Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, like, like, luckily I backed out of staying there about a, a week before and reboxed into a hotel. So, yeah. Yeah, I've heard some uh, some bright horror stories about that place. About you know, it just it's just really dowdy, isn't it? And like, there's like wallpaper peeling off, and just like points in the in the lobby where a phone used to be, where it's just kind of been ripped off the wall, and there's like a wire hanging out where it used to be, and someone's just like painted around it. It's just like. Wow, this I is... will I will say one thing about Blackpool. It's fantastic, fantastic event. It was a uh, great to see so many Dreamcast fans. Mm-hmm. If uh, you go on Twitter, uh, anyone listen to this podcast, um, there is a, a video of our beloved leader Tom dancing oh, um, <laughs> on the Saturday night. Uh, it's a very interesting video. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not entirely sure what he's trying to do, but it's it, he has some rhythm and it's it's pretty good. Um, he was a little bit drunk, which is fine. We got back to the hotel without any problems. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's got it, it features um, Adam Buchanan from Retro Collect and Tom um, doing some incredibly weird moves. Um, you need you need to put that up on Twitter, Mike, with a caption. You'll never believe what the leader of the Dreamcast Junkyard gets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm quite uh, taken about that you're calling me a leader uh, <laughs> in the first place. Um, anyway, yeah, so uh, play that pool uh, was great, and um, yeah, here's to many more. Uh, play events in the future yes okay right let's move on uh to the first sort of major point at 42 minutes into the podcast um we, <laughs> we want to talk a little bit about the dc hdmi i'm sure you've seen that if you're a regular visitor to the blog um i've put up several posts about this now and i'm quite frankly blown away by it i think a lot of people are blown away by it as well at play expo blackpool because we did have it on the big tv set up um with um, a couple of games that really show off the dreamcast kind of graphical power things like uh, tokyo highway challenge 2 um, yes and the, the crispness of this image is fantastic. Yeah, it, it, the videos I put up online and on YouTube, they don't really do it justice. You have to see it on a screen in front of you, like kind of with the naked eye. It's not it, it, going going off like stuff that you see on the internet. It's been through so many different kind of processes and you know editing and then re-uploading and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't really show you how good it looks in reality. So just please believe me how amazing it looks compared to these other cables that are out at the moment. These like from Pound and um, I think Bihar Bros and uh, I think Hyperkin have got one kind of coming on the way as well. Um, basically, all they do is take the VGA signal from the Dreamcast 480p, 
put it out through an HDMI cable and then you put it on a TV that has an HDMI connection. What the DCMI, DC HDMI is, it's an internal mod, sits underneath the main board on the Dreamcast, it's wired directly to the GPU. So it's, there's no di analog interference, it's taking the digital signal directly from the, the Dreamcast sort of graphics output and uh, putting it out um, in basically, uh, you know, super crisp. The, the highest resolution it can do is it's 1080p, but it's kind of 960 sort of bordered. Um, yeah, it's it's phenomenal piece of work by uh, his, his name is Dan, uh, Dan and Chris, but they go by uh, Citrus three thousand PSI and uh, Chris twenty six hundred online. Uh, these are the same guys who did the uh, the Wii boards that are putting out sort of really good crisp crisp images on the for the Wii, the original Wii, and um, and yeah, it's it's just a really really cool mod, and hopefully when it launches for your know, pre order. Um, it'll be a, a roaring success that it deserves to be. Uh, I've never seen Dreamcast games look this good, to be honest. I know there's things like right. the, um, what, what's it called, the thing that you've got, uh, Ross? The um, the thing that does the upscale. The Meister, the, the OSSC. One. Well, e e any one of those, really. Take your pick. Um, without even without yeah, so underneath my, one of those. So, but, but Ross, I know you wanted to talk about my, this. So please. My big, yeah, my big question is. Um, so I, I've tried Frame Meister, OSSC, Acura, and combinations of them. Mm -hmm. And with if you use just the Acura or just the OSSC, on every TV I've tried at least, you get this dotty image where if you look closely, it's like the whole image is made up of these dots. Yes, yeah. I know exactly. What not you mean. like a pixel. And some people call it divering, but I'm not sure I buy that because my understanding of what divering is is, for example, on the Mega Drive when the color palette was limited, they'd like make they'd like use a cross -hatch. Like the cross checkerboard yeah, effect. Yeah. And 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 on this on a CRT that isn't so sharp like compared to HDTVs nowadays, it would give the illusion that the Mega Drive was putting out these colours it couldn't do or transparency effects mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And that's not so. People call it divering on Dreamcast. I, maybe there's enough. Maybe divering can mean that, and it's just I'm ignorant of that. But I don't know what to call it. But it's this horrible dotty image. Yeah. And I and if I put it through the Frame Meister, I don't get that. If I put it into my Sega. Uh, 480p VGA monitor, you don't see that. And I was wondering about the what, what's it called, the HD DC, DC HDMI. Yeah. H, yeah, DC HDMI. I was wondering if you get up close if if it's the same deal as well with the OSSC. It's Acura interesting. Or what? It's interesting. Um, if if I put it onto my 4K TV, there is there is a slight sort of you can see it if you get really really close. If I put it onto the 1080p. Um, flat screen that I've got. You can't see it at all. So I don't know if it's something to do with the TV, the, the resolution of the Whereas TV. Whereas on or... that same 1080p television, if you use the Acura, oh, yeah, you, can you see can it. see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there is an improvement there as well. I mean, you can see it straight from the off. When you turn the thing on, the Dreamcast world comes up, you're like, bam, that is super yeah. sharp. Wow. Do you know what I mean? It's not like mm. it, it well, is on with the other things. Um, the thing is, it's very difficult to tell in captured footage as well. Like, yeah. I've seen captured footage using the OSSC and the Acura, and you, you can't see it at all, this this uh, this dotty image I'm talking about. so Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think, I think you're, fighting yeah. up, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle trying to explain to people online using the tools that we have at our yeah. disposal why it's so good. You have to see it. Mike, I know you saw it for the first time at um, yeah. Play Blackpool. I mean, you said it looked amazing to me. You were like, yes. wow. You know. Well, we had we had a couple of Dreamcasts with the HDMI cables on, didn't we? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other side, and you could see it, it was it was slightly got up close. You could see it was it was slightly as 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 Ross said, dotty. The the DC HDMI was is it's crystal clear, it's perfect. Really, we were playing um, Tokyo Highway Challenge too, um, and the, the the lighting and the effects on the cars were were was as good quality as a 360 aim. Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm. It was amazing. I remember walking back from, um, I think I was going to the bar or something. <laughs> I was walking back. Probably. The, yeah, I was walking back. To, <laughs> Standard. Find out what goes when the lights go out. I was, I was staggering back from the bar to the uh, Dreamcast Junkyard section through the crowd. And because we had that big TV on, like that big HD TV on, when I was standing, yeah. I could see somebody playing um, uh, Tokyo Highway Challenge from you know a distance. And it just looked amazing, even from yeah. so far away. I was like, wow, that is super sharp. And it, it just got better and better as I got closer. So yeah, it's um, it's definitely something that I would recommend people check out. If you, I mean, this mod is, it, I believe, what the way that it works is that you have to send it. You send your Dreamcast to Chris, and he will install it for you. I don't know if he's actually offering like a kit or anything so far, but then he installs price. it. Uh, that, that's the next thing I'm getting on to. Um, the price so far is one hundred and fifty dollars. Now, mm. obviously, one hundred fifty dollars uh, is a lot of money. 
you know, and the difference between $150 and like maybe $30 for one of these cables. If you're not that bothered, if you, all you want to do is plug your telly, it, sorry, your Dreamcast into a telly and play a game, boom, it's on the telly. You're not really that bothered as long as you can see what you're doing. Then by all means, get a Pound, get the Gecko, get the Acura. Any one of these uh, devices work just fine. They're actually they're perfect. You know, they, they do the job well. If you're an aficionado who wants to get the very best out of your, your Dreamcast and also want to see what it can do, then I would, you know, wholeheartedly recommend the DC HDMI. It's a fantastic modification. And look, this thing has been in development for quite some time. It's it's a, it's a really, really well made piece of kit. You know, it's got an FPGA on there. It's you know, it's wired directly into the GPU. They're not messing about these guys. It's not a, a little kind of side project that they've just been doing in the spare time. This is they've been working on this full time for quite some time now, and you can tell. It's just it's phenomenal what it does. I mean, um, that, that's fairly expensive, but it's not yeah. unreasonable for like no. the amount of development hours they must have put into that. The limited audience of people that are going to buy it. Mm. Andy's going to mod the console for you. Mm. It's not unreasonable, but yeah, it is expensive. I mean, I'm, I've not really even spoken about a lot of the other th things that you can do. I mean, the thing's got a Wi-Fi adapter built into it, so you can access the menu from within the Dreamcast um, kind of you know uh, OS. You know, you set it on with no game in it. Um, and you can connect it to your Wi-Fi in your house, and it can download over Wi-Fi the, uh, the updates that they release every now and then. Um, right. It's got um, actual um, accurate kind of uh, reproduction of the um, the full sort of aspect ratio of the um, 480p image that the Dreamcast puts out through VGA. Uh, Chris was explaining this to me. He's a lot more knowledgeable than I am about this. So if I get this wrong, please you know forgive me. But from what I can gather. These um, these things that are taking the VGA signal, the, the, the Acura, or the Gecko, etc., they don't use the full sort of width of the screen, so they kind of squash it slightly. So, so he described it as circles become slight no, ovals. Whereas no, the, what 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 it what it is is um, the original output of the Dreamcast isn't just standard four eighty p. It's right. it's slightly wider for whatever reason. And if mm. you just feed that directly into a TV without altering it, then the TV will automatically fit that. So, but usually on usually it's 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 so it is so it's six it's it is four eighty p the actual the the area of the screen that displays an image is four eighty p but there's these borders that the Dreamcast adds for some reason that are always blank yeah um they're either white at startup or black while you're playing a game and so basically if if you put that if you feed that image into most modern TVs they will just try to um, adjust that so they fit the whole image, including the borders that aren't used, onto your screen. And, uh, and of course, that the image that... What, what The resulting image is that it's squashed. Yes. And yes, it will make like stuff oval instead of spherical, exactly. or it will be slightly too skinny. Totally. Like, cars so, will look too boxy or whatever, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, at some point we will get uh, Dan... On the on the podcast to explain that maybe when it's kind of fully out and people have got them in their in their sort of collections and have actually had the chance to try and play it and use it, um, we will get Dan on and, and he can explain it sort of in more technical speak without us kind of butchering it and sort of <laughs> um, getting things wrong. Uh, but um, yeah, from you know my point of view, I think it's a an amazing achievement and to to have Dreamcast games looking this good on, on modern TVs is you know far and above what you would expect from a from a retro system brilliant piece of kit um so yeah great stuff what else can i say um if nobody else has got anything else to add on that topic i think we should move on to the next yeah yeah cool yeah okay um sega shop has launched Yay, in the uk free. and europe uh i have purchased uh, one of the hats you know the bubble hats yeah, and, um, and one of those T-shirts with the sort of the different coloured sleeves with the Dreamcast sign in the middle. Has anyone else bought anything? Oh, I got that. I got that one too. Yeah, so. I got that as well. <laughs> yeah, should all yeah. wear it together for yeah, like the, the next uh, meetup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so people who don't know, basically, Sega has had a store in. I think there's one in Japan and one in the States, and um, we've not really had one sort of for European uh, customers prior to this. Um, so it's quite cool. And one of the differences that I've noticed is that. There's a lot of more. There's a lot more sort of specific Dreamcast branded stuff on the on the European sites than yeah. there are on the uh, United States site. So a lot of people have been commenting saying, "Oh, you guys in the Europe always get the best thing." And I, well, no, you've had a store, you know, for for, for about a year now. Um, Ross, you said there's a store in Japan. Is that right? 
Yeah, I've bought a few things from a store in Japan. I've got a Dreamcast mug, a coaster, a, a fridge magnet. Hmm. Um, those those um, Sega hardware calendars. Oh, is that where they came um, from? Yeah, yeah, I like that. yeah, they came from there. Yeah, um, I've got a Sonic tin pencil case. <laughs> um, it's got like Green Hill Zone on the front from there. <laughs> You stick it. Yeah, I've got a load, a load of shit. It's actually, it's actually Dreamcast. Sorry, the uh, Japanese store at least is actually really quite reasonable though. Like the, it's the same as the UK one. I was just going to say the pencil the price case is really good. Oh, is it exactly the same? Because the, the, the pencil case I bought was like a five or something like that. It's really cheap. And then the remember? t-shirts were like twelve quid, which you know, again, is you, 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 most of these things are like eighteen quid if you look at into coin and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. So it's uh, so I thought it was pretty, pretty good. I would this yeah, guy battle. I think that um, I think that they're made by a company called Numskull, and like, yeah. um, I've actually bought. I think they had. I found it. It was in game once. They had this notebook that was shaped like the Dreamcast. I don't know if you've ever oh, yeah. seen those before. Yes. That was like really good. I was really impressed by their kind of attention to detail, like on the uh, the actual notebook itself, but inside all the little Dreamcast logos and stuff. And yeah. I get this impression they actually like really kind of, if you look at any of their other merch, regardless of whether or not it's Sega, you get this impression that the people who make it actually know what they're making merch for, yeah. which um, is why I really love what they put on the Sega store, like the especially the bobble hat. I think the bobble hat's the the winner in my <laughs> eyes, um, and I'm definitely going to get one. But um, I just want to say the t-shirts as well. If you look at them, you're just thinking, yeah, like this is this feels like you know an official Dreamcast thing, and. I just want to say it is a million times better than those horrid shirts they put out in Urban Outfitters with like the oh Japanese text yeah. and the European blue swell. Like that upset me so much. <laughs> that... I don't know if you boys looked at the um, the Sega coll- uh, the sorry the Sonic collection on there as well, but there was um, some of the T-shirts that they've got in the Sonic collection are really nice. But the best thing was the socks, the Sonic socks that look like his red shoe. So he's got like his red <laughs> shoe with like a little oh, white cool. band at the top, and then the top of the sock. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I blue, a pair of them like, as well. It looks yeah. awesome. <laughs> there's, cool. there's also uh, there's also a pair of socks. Um, maybe the same same guys, but it's uh, for some reason it's actually right in front of me right now. The actual dirty sock itself. Um, <laughs> the, the, the the bottom part of the sock is like checkered, like Green Hill Zone, and then um, there's like a little stripe above that that's green, and then blue for the sky. And it just so happens I have a tattoo a tattoo of Sonic the Hedgehog on my leg and when I wear these socks it looks like he's running across <laughs> Green Hill Zone so I was so particularly what, happy with him you have a the, tattoo of Sonic uh, on your leg they're looking at Mankey now like, yes yes wow. <laughs> just a, a heads up for people in, in the UK as well though not to disparage Sega shop but there's actually a pack of four uh, Sonic socks in Tesco's at the current time which uh. has the exact same sock we're talking about with the, the checkered effect it has um, a Dr. Robotnik one and it has Sonic shoes as well. Pack a fourth, like five pound. Oh, Maybe that's nice. where I got mine from. I can't even remember where I got mine yeah. from now. Maybe that, that. Maybe that's the pair I got. I got like four sets because you know you can never have too many Sonic socks. <laughs> I'm waiting for um, I'm waiting for Christmas. So when this hat turns up, this bobble hat with Dreamcast written on it, I can wear it uh, with a, a nice ensemble piece. With a, I've got my PlayStation Christmas jumper, so I can really kind of mix the uh, mix the brands. You know what I mean? And confuse people. Ooh. Oh, is he a, is he a PlayStation fan or a Dreamcast fan? Which one is he? Uh, you know, I'll keep him guessing. Oh, edgy. Keep him guessing. You know. <laughs> you <Yeah>. bad man. <laughs> the Yakuza merch was really cool as well yeah, yeah. Nice. the yakuza really, stuff. Nice. really good they had they had yakuza um aftershave in japan <laughs> a few years ago. yakuza right. branded aftershave yeah what does that smell of um <laughs> fear i didn't buy it <laughs> yeah corruption I, <laughs> yeah i mean it just smelled like aftershave to me but yeah yeah, yeah well. uh, I've, I've, I've just actually been on the uh, Sega shop just having a quick look at because I ordered quite a few Dreamcast bits as well and the Sega Swirl t-shirt and the mug are now out of stock so yes. uh, yeah clearly you know people have been on there and kind of you know exactly the same force as us that it is very very nice merch uh, as merch goes so yeah. maybe we should give the uh, the address out as well it's segashop.co.uk or segashop.eu for the European version um, but yeah uh, it's, it's it's looking good from, from my yeah, point of view so- yeah the, uh, so you mentioned obviously that, that the US shop's been been around for a while. Did anyone else get the Sonic toaster uh, a couple of months ago? Uh, no, everyone get that. Have you got it? So 
Yeah, yeah, yes, I ordered it um, because it was the only thing on the Sega um, America shop, which they actually, because basically they, they said that they needed to get a thousand pre-orders in order to make it happen. Right. Um, and it was on like 800. And because like, loads of UK fans were saying to them on Twitter, look, you know, I do want to buy this, but you've set it so that it's UK, it's, it's US only shipping. So for the last two days, they opened it up worldwide and that's like, I, I got one. But then a, a friend of mine got his and he made a video on it on YouTube and he plugged it in even with an adapter. Uh, you know, like a um, a US to UK uh, adapter box thing, mm. and it it just starts smoking. Like even though there's nothing in it, and then his adapter started smoking. And then he did he just use an adapter, or did he use a step down converter? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it was it was like a full on step down converter that he said he, that oh, right. he used specifically quite a few things. Like the step down converter just started like almost melting smoke coming out of it. So he unplugged <laughs> it and was like, "Well, gonna leave that then." So uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so, it's probably. It's probably pl- powered by all the leftover components of all the Dreamcast they could never sell that were sitting <laughs> oh, yeah. on pallets in yeah. warehouses somewhere. Maybe you meant to plug it in and it kind of explodes into a ball of flame and then you meant to just like hold bread over it as it burns. That's, <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, t- to be fair, because uh, I'd, I'd actually ordered a step-down converter online, and then I saw his video, so it was kind of like you know the canary down the mine shaft. Like I saw him do it, and now I'm like, actually, I'm all right. I'm just, I'm just going to leave it in the box. Put fine. it on the shelf. Put it on the shelf. Leave it. Dot. Dot. Yeah. Under no circumstances, <laughs> try and use it. Yeah. Oh, Whack it on eBay with a use at your own risk uh, warning in the description, <laughs> yeah. and just just uh, make a bank out of it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. So yeah, that's the Sega shop. Check it out if you uh, want some uh, decent looking merch. Um, okay, uh, next on our agenda, I uh, don't know if any of you guys saw this. Um, there's a guy who is creating uh, new console cases for the Dreamcast. Uh, it's causing a bit of a, a split, you know, a bit of a divide in the community about you know what they look like. Uh, basically, this guy he runs a company called TR Fight Stick, uh, based in Turkey, and um, he's uh, he's he's created a range of uh, fight sticks as the name suggests in the past using a range of materials wood metal they do look pretty good to be honest and by all accounts they're actually really high quality um, and now he's turned his attention to the dreamcast and so what he's doing is he's creating a, a bespoke console case um to replace our kind of yellowing and, and creaking old ones um and that, that you'll be able to put the innards of the dreamcast into and it just looks like a completely kind of enclosed unit um i believe the only downside to this is that it's only compatible with Dreamcasts that use like, an internal storage device to put the games on, because there's no way to put G ROMs into this thing without you know taking the bottom of the thing off again. Um, personally, I think it looks pretty cool. Um, I like the style of it. It's very minimalist. It's made of metal. It's got a nice kind of etched Dreamcast swell on the top of it. I believe he's going to be producing them in wood as well. Um, don't know how much of a fire risk that might be. Uh, putting you know, <laughs> <laughs> things that have electricity coursing through them inside a wood cabinet, uh, you know, with minimal kind of ventilation. But you know, time will tell. Um, I just wondered what what you guys it's been think. Done before it's been done. Oh, it was done with the, the was it Neo, Neo Geo? That's stuff. it. Yes, I, I, I stand corrected. Yeah, but uh, yeah, any thoughts? Oh, one thing I will add as well is it's been done in a con- a collaboration with Bihar Bros, who are known for their kind of high quality. Um, devices that they put out, that handmade, high quality, um, yeah, peripherals. So, uh, yeah, any any thoughts on these guys? I, I, personally, I, 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 it's one of those. I mean, I think maybe because I'm a bit of a purist with the whole, you know, I, I, I do love having games and actually be able to buy discs and putting discs in. And as soon yeah. as, as yeah. soon as I saw that that wasn't part of the option, I just kind of thought, well, for me personally, and obviously it is only personal opinion, but it's completely pointless. Like, yeah, yeah. and plus, like the look of a Dreamcast to me, it like, you know, it really is a beautiful console. And I think, um, like just changing that for something that looks like, and again, like you know, I'm, I'm sure that the guy's very, very good at what he does. I'm not being disparaging, but it looks a bit like a DVD player. Mm. Um, um, like I'm not, I'm like for me, it's not something that I would want. But again, I can see if someone maybe isn't bothered about discs and everything's on GD, uh, you know, G, GD ROM, uh, sorry, uh, GDMU and stuff like that. Maybe for those guys, but yeah, for me, definitely not. I thought it looks uh, like a, if you've ever seen it, maybe Google it, like a, a Mac Mini, like the. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah. it really. I thought I saw it. I thought it, I, I think I think I saw the picture. I was like, is that a Mac Mini? And then basically, obviously, it's not because it's on the Dreamcast junkyard, and you don't talk about Macs. So. <laughs> 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 I, I agree. agree. Sometimes. I agree with it being. I think it's probably the last of the best looking traditional consoles i don't think there's been a better looking console since the dreamcast um i think maybe the only one actually no because even the gamecube is is of quite an acquired taste shall we say but that's probably the only other console that i would you know has that that traditional almost toy like um 
uh, visual appearance to it. So I totally agree. I wouldn't want to change mine at all. Even I like the shade of slightly off cream that mine's turned into and i don't even want i don't even want to use tom's fantastic technique because my uh to, to whiten it because my dreamcast is my dreamcast from mm. from when when they launched and i don't want to change it to be honest mate that that technique it, 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 the, the, the yellowing returns anyway after a while so i mean I'm, I'm not the truth the truth comes out now tom honestly <laughs> well, yeah, come on it's been, you, like, what, you, you... <laughs> it's been like three or four years now you know what i mean so you know, and I do sit in front of my Dreamcast with a massive cigar, blowing mm. smoke all over them all day. So. <laughs> Just smoking like eighty a day. <laughs> would buy, would buy. To Power Stone. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think if you had more than one Dreamcast, it would probably be quite cool to have one of these as well. Yeah. But yeah. I just have the one, and I've got all these discs that I don't want to just have sitting on my shelf and not being used. So I'm probably uh, similar to some of the other guys here. Just. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a cool novelty, I think, mm. more than anything. I kind of, you know, my point, my yeah, point would, of view is um, it, that... It would be... Go ahead, Scott, uh, Ross. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm just talking over each other. No, man. As a, it would be, like, for me, I've got two Dreamcasts on my side, one for GDMU and one for regular discs. I mean, it would be pretty cool to put, like, a GDMU in this and that HDMI mod and have it all in this shiny, mm. more modern-looking case. But then, at, at the same time... Um, I've always liked like the iconic look of the consoles of all my consoles. Like I've I've never been one to buy these limited edition consoles or change the cases or whatever because I've always just preferred the iconic look. For example, I had a black GameCube and I ended up flogging it just so I could get a purple one because that's how we all remember the GameCube. I've always just preferred the base iconic look of each console. Yeah, yeah. No, just yeah. To, just to sort of mimic what what you said there, Ross, um, or rather mirror. Um, I can see that this would have a market for people who maybe do have a GDMU, um, in, you know, installed in their Dreamcast, and maybe have more than one. I totally see what you're saying. The Dreamcast is an iconic looking machine. It's that's what it looks like. Do you know what I mean? It's you know, you see a Dreamcast shell from a mile away, you know what it is. Um, this new thing from TR Fight Stick, it, it looks like uh, like you said, Lewis. It looks like a a small uh, form PC or something. However. Mm -hmm. If you do have multiple Dreamcasts and you do want something a little bit different, I can totally see the appeal. Um, so I, I guess it's just down to the individual kind of. Um, well, yeah, but this would look taste. quite nice to like to like a super like the Super NT or mm. the analog NT Mini and the new Mega SG and all these like modern clone consoles are coming out. It'd look quite cool in a more modern setup like that. But yeah. You know when I when I, when I first saw the line, you know about uh, new Dreamcast cases coming along, I I was really hopeful that actually you know someone might be out there just designing like replica PAL cases because I was yeah, like they crack, the yeah yeah you know oh, like, I was like, you know, like they just <laughs> crumble to dust like wheat. Josh Todd uh, must have it. thousands of them. Surely, yeah. Someone, I, I was speaking to somebody online about this recently, right? Uh, basically, the the Josh Prod boxes that the cases the games are coming in. They're, they're, they're new. They're, they're not old yeah. stock. They're, they're new. They've yeah. been remade. So I reckon he somehow got the moulds for, for the for the for the game cases. Because if you have a look at them, they've got the seams down the sides that the actual Dreamcast games themselves, the official yeah. ones, don't have. So they are new. The, the new boxes that have been made by someone somewhere. Obviously, he won't tell me where because obviously he's not going to give away his secrets for you know his success. Uh -huh. But on that front, somebody somebody must have moulds for Dreamcast console shells as well. Why don't? Yep. Why aren't we seeing a new range of different coloured, like multi-coloured console shells? If look, if somebody had those modes and they could put them out at a decent, you know, uh, price, I'd buy. I'd buy several to replace some of the sort of yellowing, stinky yep. old Dreamcasts that I've got. You know what I mean? It's, I'm sure someone with the know-how can do it with a 3D printer yeah. now without the modes. I'm sure it's possible. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I seem to. I seem to remember reading an article um, somewhere. A, a while ago around um the atari jaguar molds and mm. i think there was um it may even have been atari age or somewhere like that but somebody was talking about um you know they 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 they'd had the um the original molds but the cost to actually produce some um was just you know ridiculous given the the amount of potential interest that would be involved uh, that so was I, the Clico chameleon uh, the bustle the yeah. the <laughs> Clico chameleon <laughs> guy bought the molds yeah off some guy and that was his main selling point when i it's like i haven't i haven't got a cop plan i haven't got the we haven't got, got the, the hardware shells, sorted out yeah. i haven't got the games but i've got Atari jaguar shells yeah because then they ended up saying like well just produce the shells then because you're going to sell more shells to people with jaguars yeah you are this you know 
shit heap of a console. <laughs> yeah, I don't even <laughs> think it was a console. It just he was an idea. It. Yeah. it wasn't cheap. Yeah, I was yeah. actually speaking to him, the guy who actually owned the the, the guy who was running the Kamiko. The Kamiko. What the fuck? Kamiko. Kamiko <laughs> Chameleon. Um, about getting one of these translucent shells for my for my dream uh, for, for my dreamcast for my um, <laughs> for my Jaguar because I, I used to be quite heavily into the Jaguar collecting scene and that kind of thing, um, but I just decided against it eventually. Um, what I was what was going to say then? Yeah, I mean, I wrote an article recently on Dreamcast Junkyard, like say basically, is there a is there a market for Dreamcast? You know, new a new range of Dreamcast aftermarket shells. I personally think there is, um, even though the community is a lot smaller than we probably think it is, or you know, uh, people outside of it think it is. Um, you know, if if they were offering, even if it was Sega themselves, you know, here's a a, a bright green like replacement shell, fourteen ninety nine. Yeah, totally twenty yeah. quid maybe. You know, even up to maybe like twenty nine ninety nine. I I'd consider it. Um, retro bit maybe maybe retro bit with all the new stuff but obviously I mean that, that may be grasping at straws well yeah who knows I mean there could be things coming up down the pipeline that we don't know about so you know we'll see we'll see what happens I suppose but yeah it's an interesting topic and I think there is definitely a market for it regardless of how small it is so yeah, yeah. cool okay guys um, I did put in the running order if there's anything else anyone wanted to talk about uh, is there anything else that anyone wants to discuss while we're yes. here assembled Wait. Very quickly, Tom. Cool. Um, Go ahead, Mike. I want to bring people's attention to uh, there's uh, my poor uh, knowledge of Japanese will hinder me here slightly, but there's a Dreamcast Complete Guidebook being released on the 2nd of December oh, yes. Um, yes. in Japan. Um, it's on Play What's Asia, that? so you can get it from Play Asia. I've, I've bought my copy, £20. Is that all? Um, it looks, yeah, £20. It looks amazing. Uh, it's got loads of pictures. Uh, Dreamcast Gaga's. Uh, really promoting it heavily on mm. on twitter mm-hmm. uh, it looks fantastic uh it's going to feature every dreamcast japanese release uh, all limited editions all vmus hardware um i would recommend people picking up there's two great dreamcast books coming out now within within a few months of each other so um it's going to be it called even... mike i'm trying to find it now it's called the dreamcast complete guidebook <laughs> that's actually what it's called yeah, I was speaking uh, to DC Gagger about this the other day on, on Twitter by, by by Messenger. And um he was saying that the guy who's actually running this um who's actually creating this book uh, is, is like mm. he's a massive collector, a big fan of the Dreamcaster. Yes. He seems like the real deal. It's not just like one of these like cash grab things where somebody comes along oh. and goes, Oh, the Dreamcast's quite popular, let's make a book about it. He's this guy's been like a collector from like sort of year year dot. So uh, yeah. yeah, it looks quite promising. I've seen some of the images that he's been tweeting out and it does look pretty cool. A lot of um like advertising materials as well, you know for certain games, yes. Japanese posters, yeah. um, all the different console variations. Um, so, yeah, it looks like it could be a good one. The only caveat for me is that it's all in Japanese, so I won't be able to read it. However, pictures and stuff look really cool. So, yeah, I think I might be making a purchase. I think yeah. a lot of these books, you end up as sort of coffee table books anyway, don't they, where you just kind of pick up and flick through and look at the nice screenshots and things. I've, I've got a um, an N64 anthology, which is just exactly that. There's huge, lovely write-ups of everything, but I end up just flicking through the th- screenshots thinking thinking back to playing the games when I, you know, back in the day. That's a great That's thing, these. Yeah, it's, I think the only, the only obviously, Hardcore Gaming 101 do their fantastic books, which are, mm-hmm. are proper written ones. I'd love to see a Dreamcast uh, one of them one day, but the, the Dreamcast Complete Guidebook, I think it's just the fact that there's so much rare stuff in it and stuff which we don't really see, and he's, he's got the pictures into the book, so it looks like it's going to be a really uh, interesting, interesting book. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to um, create a book like you know of like our kind of editorial pieces, you know, from the blog, but mm. kind of like sort of slightly tailored so they don't include like links or whatnot. But I think it's just such a massive undertaking because there's so much content on the, on the blog. Uh, we'd have to be really kind of... It'd take a lot to pick out the things that we would like to put into the book. Do you know what I mean, or even just use them as a basis for for new content, you know, for for, for a book like that. But uh, yeah, it's good that you mentioned Hardcore Gaming One Hundred One's books because I've seen some of their stuff, and it, it, I think it was a Castlevania book they did, um, yeah. which is just phenomenal. There's amount the amount of detail and, and the artwork, etc. is is brilliant. So yeah, food for thought. Cool. Okay. Uh, any more for any more? Um... Yeah, so before we go, five minutes, I'd like to, to for you all to cast your minds back 18 years ago um, to the, the the winter of 2000. Dreamcast is a year old, um, yep. because I have the November-December issue of Dreamcast magazine in front of me. Ooh. We're just going to have a quick look at what's going on. So according to HMV, anyone I want to have, have any guesses as to what was in their top 10? 
in sort of November time. Code Veronica. Maybe? Sorry, one more time. What year? What year? This, so this is two thousand. So November two thousand. Yeah. Um, but it would have been probably Shenmue. you're talking October's data, uh, I would guess. Yeah, I'm going to go Shenmue, for. No. I'm going to say Code Veronica. Is that out yet? It's not in the chart. Shenmue oh. wouldn't have been out yet. No. Um, um, what would have been, I, I'm going to guess Sonic Adventures still in there because I guess it was never out the charts. This is going really badly, boys. It's not in. There. MSR. MSR huh? must be there. No. It's oh. a really, I will say this is a really shitty chart. If you need an expression, <laughs> okay. Spirit <laughs> Speed 937. <laughs> I'll give you. So the, the top of the chart is WWF. Virtual World Tennis. Virtual Tennis. Not bad. Virtual Tennis number two. Thank you. Hey. Number three is was in the charts for months and it was utter shit. Uh, doesn't narrow it down. Um, <laughs> it's a sock again. Multi platform, published by EDOS. Uh, Tomb Raider Chronicles. Fighting Force Two. No, big big shitter. <laughs> Fighting Force <laughs> shitter than Fighting Force Two. Yeah. Fuck me. Uh, that's that's difficult. I I won't. Ooh. Who wants to be? Oh, I know. I. Oh, uh, oh, oh, I, I was gonna say. Um, I was gonna say. <coughs> I, I can't think of the name. I can't think of the name of the game. The one where you're kind of um, like a cop, female cop, running around the city. Really crap. Uh, Urban Chaos. Urban Chaos. Urban Chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say that. Uh, other, other games in the chart include Power Stone 2, brilliant yeah. game. Wacky yes. Races. I really like Great that. Game. Yeah. Uh, Hidden and Dangerous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Space Channel <laughs> 5. Uh, no. Mm-hmm. International Track and Field, which I always forget was on Dreamcast. I don't know what, because that game is so synonymous with PlayStation for me. And mm-hmm. growing up playing it as a kid on the PlayStation with a multi tab, I just always forget that is on, uh, it's few, on Dreamcast. Uh, uh, so games games well, as well. Correct, yeah. yeah. And then the last one is Crazy Taxi, was still uh, hanging on. Uh, <laughs> so, from a review perspective, we'll see if we can guess the scores. The first one is Shenmue, that should be an obvious one. There's an official, official magazine. Official Dreamcast magazine. 10, yeah. Eight, yeah. Ten, 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 ten out of ten. ten. It is ten. Was that the only ten they gave to anything? It was the only ten, I believe. Maybe Soul Calibur? Or was... No, maybe it was the only ten. I think you might be right on Soul Calibur. I did, I did subscribe to it. either Soul Calibur and Shenmue or just Shenmue. I, I can't remember any others. I didn't. So I didn't. Next... Uh, I wasn't rich enough to get the uh, official Dreamcast magazine. I, <laughs> to, I slummed it with uh, DC UK and Dreamcast magazine. You know, I, was keep, I was keeping it real. <laughs> I, 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 I got. Sorry, I wasn't a subscriber, but I bought them every month. Um, official Dreamcast magazine and the Dreamcast magazine. Excellent. And yeah, I think I, I went without lunch for a couple of days. School lunch. <laughs> don't, try don't try and go back. Don't try and go back. I always. <laughs> I always <laughs> I'm boring you. I was boring you. I always used to get the. Um, I had one fish. bed in my house between five siblings. <laughs> It was always the uh, the official PlayStation magazine for me, and then obviously it was natural to go onto the official Dreamcast because I couldn't have lived without the demo every month. Because you know, yeah. at that at that age, you'd have like one game every three months if you were lucky. So it was yeah. you lived off demos. But the other thing was um, uh, CVG magazine used to complement it really nicely for me because yeah, yeah. it was like a quid or something, or like one pound twenty or something like that. Well, it was really okay, cheap, wasn't it? it was like ninety nine p at one point, I think. Yeah, it, went yeah, really cheap. it was. Yeah, yeah. sorry. I, I, used to, I used to love CVG as well. It was mm. really one of my favourite uh, magazines growing up. Uh, next up is Jet Set Radio. Uh, nine. nine, nine. Ooh, yeah, nine. gotta be a nine. Solid yeah. nine. Nine. Nines, yeah, nine. No, it's an eight. Ooh, Ooh really? I, I was wondering eight. I don't know because I I think like uh, it's an amazing game, but I guess it does have kind of some awkward. Uh, sometimes the controls could be quite awkward. I was thinking what yeah. could knock it down, so I was thinking eight or nine. So, they yeah. um, I've um, I need to pick up a copy of that actually because they've just re uh, relaunched all the leaderboards and everything on that on Dream yeah. Pie, So I've I'm got two copies, mate. So if you want one, uh... oh mate, there you go. Put one aside for me, Tom. Yeah, next we'll weekend. do. No worries. Um. Ready to rumble, box in round two. I'm going to seven, eight, 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 seven, 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 seven. Eight. It's an eight. It's oh. an eight. Mm. Well, it's not as good uh, as radio, so that's silly. <laughs> <laughs> they should write a book, Mike, with every game reviewed, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> some should do. It'd be crazy some sad do bastard should do that. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> the next game is one of Tom's favourites, if not one of, if not your favourite Dreamcast game from memory, um, Le Mans 24 Hours. Ah, uh, nine. Seven. I'm going to go for... Seven. I, remember, I the... remember that being reviewed. Wait, I remember the review. Yeah. Uh, Don't they do 24 Hours? They, they allegedly uh, did. They I'm going to go... 
I do. Ju- I do. I'm going to go uh, for an eight. eight, eight. eight. I'm going to go yeah. for an eight. Yeah, it's eight. I'll go seven. They do. Um, you are right, Mike. They do a 24-hour race. I'm. I, I'm not one to call foul on things when I've got no evidence. But um, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely convinced they no. stayed up for 24 hours playing the game. They didn't. The they gave it an eight out of ten. Yeah. Um, yeah. Difficult learning curve and handling can raise a few eyebrows. Being the uh, the only down points. Okay. Next up, we have Silent Scope. Six. Yeah, six. Yeah, six. <laughs> I really yeah. liked Silent Scope. I thought that was such a good game. I mean, granted, in the arcade, it was much more enjoyable with an actual sniper rifle in your hands. Mm. But um, did uh, yeah. did anyone play the Xbox version with the actual like a uh, light gun you could get that was a a, a sniper rifle? No, no but that. it was in my local arcade in Dawlish. I played it there. It's great in the arcade. They gave Silent Scope a seven. Ooh, what? Of- yeah, <laughs> no, it's a six. I I'm, always... I'm pretty sure it's a six, Mike. <laughs> I do love the. Um, I do love when you see like it's always the problem, of course, of reviewing games using scores. I love it when you see the score and then you look at some of like the the, the pluses and minus points they give on it, and obviously they give it a seven, which is a really good score. And then one of the bullet points is basic and repetitive, which yeah. doesn't <laughs> sound like it. <laughs> uh, Does sound like Silent Scope though. It does sound like science scope, absolutely. Uh, next up, we have Giga Wing. Three. Oh, that's bad, bad. I four. Really bad. I can't remember, but yeah. I'm going to go for three four. or four. Yeah, I'm going to go for. Five. I'm going to go for Tom four. Poor graphics, slow down, too many continues, unavoidable death. Three out of ten. Oh, heartbreaking. Another unfor- oh, well, a unremembered Dreamcast game, I would say. Forgotten Dreamcast game. Star Wars Episode One: Jedi Power Battles. Yeah. Ooh, it's a PS1 port, isn't it? It's, it was crap yeah, as well. It's a mediocre. Five. Six, yeah. Six, yeah. Five. Yeah, five, 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 five. I'm going to go for five, five. Six. When the most positive thing they can say, to be fair, this is probably true of a lot of Star Wars games, is it's Star Wars. Um, <laughs> yeah. The negative thing is it's Phantom Menace. Dodgy collision detection, repetitive and frustrating, again. Uh, glitchy graphics and a ODM rating of 4 out of 10. Wow. Bit harsh. That, that magazine was just really harsh on all on a lot of 2D games, like, especially the I, I think, 2D games, like the beat-em-ups and the schmups. Yeah, I think that was a generational thing there. I think yeah. if you look back, it's the N64, they ha- it had some brilliant games that were 2D, and I think they got slated because it was kind of like well things need to be 3d now because we're we're yeah, into this yeah. generation yeah. um uh looney tunes space race Seven. right hang on eight. yeah eight this is this is one Maybe of my favorite nine. racing games of all time like it sounds stupid but i was obsessed with this growing up i'm gonna go 10 now i'm joking <laughs> <laughs> eight. Seven. Eight. Seven. Eight. I'm going for eight uh, a little too easy in places not a great deal of variety can be frustrating yeah can I seven, change it? Seven, <laughs> seven out of ten. Seven. Harsh that. Harsh. Uh, we, okay, you're saying that one's harsh. Mag Force Racing. One. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you gave it, Mike? Is that what I, you no, gave I, it? I gave it two, I think. I will say four. I've got no it's idea. Like, it's like it's like a it's like a bore, it's the most boring white hate <laughs> clone ever. It's... Yeah, it's apparently so apparently once you Three get or four. apparently once you get quite far into it when the speed gets better it actually improves the game um but i've not really put that much effort into it because you'd have to be masochistic oh. to get out far though yeah, yeah totally so they they've got a little thing here where they put like in one hour what they've managed to achieve and on this yeah. one it says in one hour we've we're already bored yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they said it was deeply unoriginal repetitive 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 and soon becomes born it boring mag, mag four eight mag force racing can be summed up by having a fridge magnet and put it around the scale electric track. <laughs> that is how the game plays. Isn't it? Uh, I wish you. I wish you were around reviewing games in like. Yeah. Uh, it's a, um, it's a it PS1 got a port. Three. It's a PS1 port of Killer Loop, I believe. Three out of it's ten, and the boring, and it? the best thing they could say they say to it was reasonable visuals. Mm-hmm. And yes, Tom, you're right. However, you didn't buy a Dreamcast to play a glorified version of a five-year-old PlayStation game. Mm-hmm. This is true. The best thing. <laughs> The best thing they could say is that is that it's actually not Spirit of Speed like in 37. That's <laughs> the best thing they could say. Um, a couple more left. Uh, another fantastic 2D beat em up. Street Fighter 3, Third Strike. Bad. It's going to be bad. I, um, I think it's lower than that. 
Mm. I think they, I think they liked, I think they liked that one. That was the one they liked. Did they? They, they didn't like Double Impact, did they? Uh was it? I can't remember. I can't remember which one. I'm gonna go load. I'm gonna go six. Five. I got six. seven. Seven. Yeah. Yeah, go on, eight. An oh. eight. Oh. 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 Yeah, they were quite yeah. high on it. Perhaps not just the radio then, yeah. Uh, oh, it, it's actually a really good port, a really good game, but I, I, for some reason I remember them giving it a bad mark, but maybe I'm thinking of the other Dreamcast magazine. Next up, and the final review this month, um, which is, I actually received this game for Christmas um, this year, so 2000, it had just come out, and it was probably one of my most played Dreamcast games, um, and... I don't know. I always thought it was much better than it got reviewed. But anyway, it's Super Runabout, San Francisco edition. Oh, five. Six. So the uppers were lots of vehicles, huge, uh, two scenarios and bonus levels, lots of longevity. Handling is fun. Handling is painful in other cars. Yeah. Uh, no multiplayer and a bit too short. Yeah. Any advances? I'll go up, up, I think, up from six. Uh, I'd go for seven. It's a six. Mm. Uh. You went a million miles off, though, boys. You're pretty good. Um, but I did want to just say one thing from this magazine that I was laughing at reading the, the previews. Um, and it's in reference to a Dreamcast game that's particularly rare. One of probably the rarest, uh, the rarest, if not if not the rarest PAL game, um, Moho. Mm -hmm. And where is it? I put a highlight on what the, the quote from this magazine about it. Um, where has it gone? Talk amongst yourselves for one moment. <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't find it now. But they basically said they were saying something like how how good it looked like it was going to be, and it was going to yeah. be a, a fantastically original, super duper new release for the Dreamcast, and it turned out to be absolute tripe. See, I quite like Moho. Really? Yeah. Well, I say like. <laughs> I like it in the same way I like the car 18. It's like sort of, there's a, there's an interesting sort of element to it. The jank. It doesn't really work, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's better, it's better than the Caddy world anyway. So yeah. I found the quote. They said it adds, it's going to add a touch of class to proceedings. Yeah. That's bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> Speak, speaking of Ducati, I, I'm interested to know where we stand on this um, issue, which is worse Ducati or spirit of speed. Oh, wow. Ducati. I go for Ducati. Ducati the only thing, the only thing I would say is that when we were at, at, at uh, a play, me and Kev, um, who was also there, we didn't mention Kev was there. Well, Kev was at the at the play. He, uh, we were watching, and there was a there was a mother with a young son, and the only like console that was free was the one with Spirit Speed, and <laughs> you could just see the face of this child. All life and energy was drained from him. <laughs> whilst the mother just sort of said. And also, Spirit of Speed killed the console. I was going to say that. The, it only did. Console, yeah. the only console that reset over the, or died over the entire two days was the one with Spirit of Speed. It refused to play any game after. Yeah, so we had to just like put that one out of, out of, out of commission, didn't we? Like, that one's off. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, was quite a juxtaposition. it was quite a juxtaposition because it was right next to the divers. So we had the divers there, like the pinnacle of like Dreamcast collecting, next to Spirit of Speed 1937, uh, and it yeah. was just like what what a comparison. <laughs> See, I think and this is possibly because I used to play a lot of sim racing games, which by their very nature aren't particularly quote fun and pick up and play. Um, like I think if you change a few things in Spirit of Speed, like you know, reduce the amount of laps, you know, the reduce the game. harsh realism. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's as bad as people make out make out it is. Oh, it I is. Just, with Spirit of Speed, it's the only racing game ever where the developers didn't think that steering was really you know, a big deal to do with the game. Yeah. <laughs> Never done I think, a racing game like I it. I think they were just a bit too they if anything, <laughs> they were a bit too honest with their uh, their source material, to be honest with you. It was uh, Maybe they could have taken a few artistic it's liberties some, when some it of the came cars, to some of the cars they included. Like you know, I know that Gran Turismo games always have that, like you know, sort of the one mile an hour old car sort of novelty. But that's like one of the actual cars in the Spirit of Speed game because he's ridiculous car. And you, you go on a race; it's like ten laps on oval. It takes like like five hours to complete the yeah, race. The, the, that's the boring. thing. The the race, like the race lengths and stuff, are, are stupid. Yeah. I quite like the way that the um, I, I quite like the way that the frame rate dip, like sort of dips horrendously when you like go onto the grass. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like it's quite realistic how it goes to like maybe three frames a second if you actually touch the grass. And, it, and yeah. the car spins <laughs> round and it's missing animation. So when it spins round, you sort of have this like 
janky. It's yeah, not a great game. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, let's put a, a uh, an end to this uh, this torture talking about Spirit of Speed 1987. Unless, of course, you are James, I think it's our most who loves it. About um, game it <laughs> That's going to become my thing now, and I'm going to be like the guy that likes Spirit of Speed. <laughs> cool. All right, Dream guys. Pod, for all your, for all your Spirit of Speed news or whatever. Yeah, I would, uh, <laughs> like to. Spirit. I'd like to thank uh, first of all Rossi's squeaky chair for its uh, appearance once again on the podcast. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody else who's here who's joined me on this uh, afternoon, and uh, also to you, the listener, for uh, deciding to press play or download wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, obviously, um, we wouldn't do this if nobody listened. So, uh, so yeah, thank you, and. Um, I think that's going to do it for this for this uh, podcast, really. Um, this is going to be a really long kind of outro because there's so many of us talking about where you can find us on the internet. Uh, but you can find myself on Twitter at Tom Lisi. You can find us all as a collective at the DC Junkyard. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash the Dreamcast Junkyard. Facebook groups is just the Dreamcast Junkyard. We're hitting, I think we're up close to 15,000 members now, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Um, so, yeah, um, guys, where can you be found? Uh, we'll start with um, Mark. We'll start with you first. Yeah, so uh, the main place to find me really is is on YouTube. So it's uh, Maz, which is M A Z Gaming UK, because uh, a lot of people seem to seem to think that think that I'm saying Mass. Uh, so uh, yeah, just to clarify, and we are also on Twitter as well. So that's at, at Maz Gaming UK. Fantastic. And Lewis, what about yourself? Um, you can find me at Lewis J F C. Um, on Twitter, uh, my other website where I write uh, my thoughts is uh, altmaguk.net. Uh, uh, I've got a few articles coming up there. I'm still faithful to the Dreamcast junkyard, though. Don't worry. And um, <laughs> yeah, um, so just find me there. If you go on the Altmag site, all the social media for that's there as well. So just follow it through on there. Fantastic. Yep, that's where uh, you find me. Excellent, uh, James. What about yourself? Um, just for general gaming ramblings amongst other groans and moans on Twitter at Agile Harvey. Excellent. Uh, Mike? Uh, yeah, my, my Twitter is at space underscore turnip. Fabulous. And <laughs> Ross, where can we find you? What's your find full address? Me. If I don't already know you, I don't really know you. <laughs> Ross will find you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Dream Pod. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Hey, it's time to make some crazy money. Are you ready? Here we go! Please stop this disc now. Now, 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 now.